Good morning, caring community. Welcome. Happy Sunday. We're glad that you're here this morning. If you're able, would you stand with us in worship? a minute to greet everyone.
you all hear me? Hey, there we go. I hear myself now. Praise God. Welcome this morning. Welcome to those who are watching online. Thank God for this beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning. Thank Him for the freedom we still have coming together to worship Him and encourage one another. Praise God for that. Hey, VBS. Awesome week in VBS, and they're going to come up. They come on up now uh, to kind of demonstrate and tell you what happened. I think Donnell is going to have some little ones to come and help her out with that. To sing, maybe. Are you singing by yourself, Donnell? No. But I also want to say that while they are preparing for this, they are, there's some leftover goodies back in the cafe. Some fruit cups you can take home. There's watermelon that you can eat there or however you want to take it. If you want to stuff it in your pockets, you can take it home. Cookies back there, other stuff that's left over from BBS. So after the service, go back and help yourself. I got to move my son right after the service, so I'm going back and have a watermelon lunch before I go do that so you can join me. Uh, any little ones coming up? There? Oh, there they are. Okay, go ahead. You got the show. <laughs> well, before they sing a few of the songs, I um, just wanted to thank you for your prayers for VBS. We certainly felt them. Um, we had 17 kids throughout the week, uh, different kids. Yeah. 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 That's good. Um, so we di did ask you to pray for strength and good health and whatnot, and so that all worked out very well. Um, we did do Adventures on Promise Island. They had a different promise every day that they learned about and had an appropriate Bible verse with it. I did want to give a shout out to Lorraine and Bill Search. Um, they did a wonderful job with the meal Friday night and um, last minute too, so it was great. And um, Karen Wolgamuth provided the macaroni and cheese. It was heavy on the carbs, macaroni and cheese and pizza, but anyway, we, it was kid appropriate food and and you could make your pizza be island like Hawaiian. I mean, we had ham and pineapple that you could put on it to make it more um, festive for our theme. So um, a lot of people did, too. I was surprised. Uh, the one kind of serious note here, um, last week I did ask you to pray for some of our kids and the heavy burdens that they carry. And um, that doesn't end now, just because BBS is over. Um, we're not going to share names, but if you could just remember these kids. Um, school's going to be starting soon. That's another whole dimension of things. Um, but there are still some kids that really, really, really would appreciate having your prayers, whether they know it or not. And we would appreciate you remembering them. Um, so thank you for caring communities. Good job with VBS. And we're going to let them sing some songs now with, with Miss Jamie and Miss Amy. Oh, I got that right. OK. And um, we do have a few more kids, but they're a little on the shy side. So um, we're going to have a trio here.
What a foundation of truth. Man, God's promises are forever. He cares about us and he is faithful. They won't get that in public schools. But you know what? It's good to hear that for us adults as well. And the best thing we can do for our children and to support what was done through VBS as adults is to live those beliefs out in our own lives, demonstrate that we believe that, no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in. God's promises are forever. He cares about us. And he is faithful. He is faithful. Let's, let's encourage each other to do that. Speaking of public schools, we are on the verge of going back to school and one thing we can all do as a church, as families, as parents who have children in preparation for going back to school, is pray for them. So this Saturday evening at 7 p.m. here at the church, we gather together to do exactly that, pray. So I hope you would uh, feel motivated by the Holy Spirit in you to come and pray. And I hope we can make this a regular thing, a, a yearly thing. This Saturday evening, here in the worship room, from 7 to 8, any questions, talk to Pat. But man, what a great thing. 
because we know the battles that rage in our public schools for the hearts and the very lives of our children. And we can sit at home and we can pray, but we can gather together today and encourage each other on that day to, to pray as well. And many, many of our kids are going back, so we have, we have faces to pray for. So. Next Sunday, baptism, we have two going to be baptized. Praise God for that. It will be done during our 1030 service, and the message will be around baptism uh, so pray about that and join us with that. And if you still are contemplating baptism, you can still sign up, obviously. There's a sign-up sheet in the lobby. And let Pat know of your intentions for that. That's going to be a great time right here at Caring Community. We're going to get the baptismal set up here and uh, see what, where God leads in that. Praise God. Mini youth meeting coming up next Sunday as well. Pay attention to that. And the following Sunday is a youth outing at the home of Jerry and Sudi Callahan in their swimming pool. Jerry, you going to be a lifeguard? Okay, all right. You certified? <laughs> Certifiable. That's right, he is. Praise God for that. Kids, bring your friends. It's going to be a good time. Next, well, Sunday the 28th, that's right after church. And pay attention to the other announcements as far as youth is concerned. We still have the Sunday morning classes going on. We had a great one this morning. And Friday, September 9th, not sure what we're doing, but set that date aside. I want to bring your attention to uh, the Gospel Friends update. It's been a while since we got an update from Guna. And he's had quite a struggle over the past couple of years. He lost his wife and lost his son who was partnering in ministry with him. So was his wife. But he's still in grieving process. But man, God is doing awesome work through Gospel Friends and Guna's leadership and we just highlighted some of the stuff that's happening. Uh, 3,000 children participated in their BS at Mount Zion. 46 believers in July were baptized, and 47 more in, July, or in, in June and then in July. 118 girls enrolled in their uh, paramedical course. Their school has 200 students. And uh, see the struggles he's been having with vertigo and shoulder problems. So we'd love to pray for that. But you guys have been supporting him for, uh, since, since you went, 2008, right? Yeah. So we've been supporting as a church, and your giving has been supporting that since 2008. And by the way, if you just want to call for logistics. Yeah. 3,000 kids have come for VBS for a week. They feed them every day. <laughs> Think about that. 3,000, and they feed them every day. And for some of those kids, it's the only food they get. It's the only meal they get. So that's just part of what we're pouring into over in India. Praise God. Other ministries you pour into, that's uh, Joe and Tana Musa, who minister to Arabic-speaking people here in Central PA and also in the Middle East. And they're about to take another missions trip uh, in the next few weeks. You can continue to support them. We have... An offering we've been taking in now, we're going to send to them. So you can still do that. We'll be praying for that as well. Other, other places, Vacation Bible School took up an offering. If you still want to donate to that, you can. They're going to collect that and send it to a church in Haiti. You can read about it there in the bulletin, uh, how God is working in that church. And Shooting Star 5K Run and Walk, that's a supporting uh, Morning Star's uh, ministry that's through the pregnancy center. You know, we do that with capillary pregnancy to support them. We do a line down in Lebanon, pray for them. So many ways to give, and, and you guys are a giving, uh, giving community here, so we praise God for that, but there's more opportunities as well. Uh, Uprise Music Festival. That's coming up in about a month, September 16th and 17th, down at Shippensburg, I believe it's at the university. Is that where it's Fairgrounds, okay, all right. Um, it's fun for all ages, not just kids, but all ages. There's going to be music, music groups down there, other things happening. If you plan on attending, let Kendall know, and he'll, she'll, she'll let you know where they're going to be set up at the festival so you can gather together as a caring family. Trust the other things in the bulletin you'll look over. Um, 
We've been talking about the Holy Spirit. Pat's going to continue preaching on that. I want to read something from God's Word from Romans chapter 11. Apostle Paul talks about, it says, verse 33, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Then he says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing and perfect. Well, what takes us from all the riches that God has for us to the point of differentiating between conforming to this world or renewing our mind, being transformed? What does that? That's the Spirit of God in us. Pat's going to be talking more about that from John 16. I pray that you're listening. Father, we thank you. Certainly thank you for your spirit that you have given all believers to help us look at this world and see see the evil within that sometimes forces us to conform. But yet by the power of your spirit, we can resist that and be transformed to be like your son Jesus. So Lord, you just didn't come and tell us the good things and then leave, but you sent your spirit, Lord, to help us. So we are, we are grateful. We pray that we that you would give us the ability to, to wake up each day and listen to your spirit within us. Lord, I, I thank you for the demonstration of what took place this week in VBS, what was taught to our little ones. It's so important, it's so truthful that even us adults need to listen to know that your promises are forever, that you care about us, that you're always faithful. Help us live them out in our lives, Lord. Help us live out what we truly believe. Not just say it, but do it. Lord, I pray for Guna a man who is still grieving from the loss of his wife and son, still struggling physically, 72 years old. But yet, Lord, we see the demonstrative demonstration of your spirit within him, ministering to so many. We know, Lord, that is a, that is a, a land of opportunity for your gospel to be preached. And I thank you for all those within this church who by the leading of the Spirit supports that ministry and all the ministries that we support global ministries we thank you for Joe and Tana what they will be doing soon we pray for their trip for protection and provision thank you again how you have helped care and community be part of that Lord I just pray for for your continued faithfulness within this body and that we would respond to your promises within our own lives. Lord, be with us now today as we come to worship you. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship team. Would you stand again with us? 
So we just give this time to the Lord this morning. coincide a lot with the sermon today based upon what your pastor has said in the prayer room. So I just wanted you to know what Kendall and I, what our process looks like. So it looks like this. Kendall has this notebook, okay? And this is Kendall to a T. So Kendall has this notebook that has things written in for like the ages, right? Sefi's laughing. He probably can, he can guess, right? This is not surprising. And so in Kendall's notebook is like new Sundays are written ahead and Okay, sorry. And old Sundays are written behind. And then there's like a few songs written based upon where we know where we're going in John and things like that. And then we look at John 16 and both of us are like, yeah, all right. Uh, so we, we pick a couple 
And then she says, you want to pick the other two, and then you want to pick them based on VBS. And so we kind of picked this one uh, based on VBS because it's a uh, promise maker, promise keeper in the first verse. And um, that was the whole point of the songs. Um, and then we just say, you know, sometimes we just crack open the giant notebook that has all of the songs. We just look through them. We're like, oh, hey, we haven't done that one in a while. And uh, sometimes we're like, oh, this one's really been speaking to us. But all that to say, it seems like random things, but um, as we're listening, they're not random, and you'll see that today. So just be encouraged by that um, as we do an old, new song to Caring, maybe.
struggle and pain. We thank you for reminding us that um, you're there and that you love us and that regardless of what it seems like, you're still working in the distance and in the background and that we can put our faith and our trust in that because we know it is true even when so many things seem like where is the truth in all of this, but we know that that is true. 
And so I, I thank you for this time. I thank you for everything that you've been doing this week at this church. I pray that you continue your good work, that uh, it happens late in the summer, not just because we, we don't want to coincide with camp, but because we want um, to empower these kids as they begin to think about going back to school, um, that they are just ready for that time, ready for all the challenges that they will face and ready to be a light of the promise keeper in your name. Amen. I need something else. I need my weapon. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a handout that comes in your bulletin once a month. It comes from Focus on the Family. And... Uh, I want to pray over the kids, and then I just want to address something that's written in here for parents. It's uh, something we need to be aware of. So I, I want to start with that after, after the kids are dismissed. So let's stretch out a hand and pray over the kids. One of the things we want to pray is their, their ability, their strength at their age to stand in what they're walking into. Into many of them, into public school, private school, wherever they're going, their ability to, to stand. So um, let's pray for them. Lord, thank you for our kids. Thank you for this generation. Thank you for their parents and their grandparents, people that are important to them in their lives, and teachers are part of that. So we pray for them in advance as they prepare to go to school. Uh, they're going to go down the hall where there are adults that love them and are going to teach them truth in a way they can understand. God, they need your Holy Spirit to help them stand in truth in the culture that they're walking in. And so we pray that into them, that you, you just embed the truth into their hearts and give them a strength, even at their age, to be able to discern truth from error and be able to stand in it. Help their parents and grandparents. Help us to help them stand. So crucial in these days. So bless them. Fill them. Pray the anointing needed on them and the teachers as they go to their time. And we pray it in Jesus' name, the church said. Amen and amen, yeah. <clears throat> there was a... Uh, there was a question that was asked in the August, Focus on the Family, this handout that comes. And it's uh, tough questions from kids. And the question was, why do we have to respect teachers? And here's the answer on the back. And then I just want to clarify something. It says, the Bible says God expects his people to respect those in authority. That is true. That includes teachers. Also, for teachers to do their best, they need your respect. If you don't cooperate, listen, and learn, you'll be hurting yourself and your future. If you respect your teachers, you'll be polite and kind, listen to them, and do what they say. To a point. We always respect those over us. That's 1 Peter 3, 14 to 16. Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have within you and do it with gentleness and respect. But it does not mean your kids have to agree with something that is unbiblical. And so we respect them, but you, we need to teach our kids. We need to help them stand because we know for a fact there are tons of absolutely great teachers out there. Teachers who love kids and are going to lead them. They know truth. They're going to lead them in truth. But we also know there's a generation of teachers who have been taught in secular institutions where a biblical worldview is not appreciated. In fact, it's impugned and it doesn't exist at all. So they are coming into the school district and teaching our kids. We know there is a curriculum that is saturating the country that is unbiblical, ungodly, and is a danger to our kids. So parents, grandparents... It's our responsibility. You have got to be aware of what our kids are being taught and teach them with respect and gentleness to stand. They do not necessarily need to agree with what they are being taught. Amen? Okay. This is, this is I, I, I mean, 
We're doing some reading and research. The curriculum that's flowing through America is a scandal. It is a scandal. And we've got to be aware. We've got to help our kids stand. Help them stand with gentleness and with respect. That's how we live out the character of Christ. So moving right into our message, um, we all need help sometimes. Our kids are going to need help. We need help. Or not just sometimes, we need help a lot of the times. All the time, right? Help understanding. We need help understanding certain subjects. A couple years ago, we made a transition. Smartphone, Bix is already laughing. Says, you're a dinosaur, Pastor. That's right. I still need help. We still, we still consult our grandkids on how to do certain things on our smartphone. Oh, yes, Bix. Oh, I long. <laughs> there are days I long to have this puppy back. It calls, and it, and it makes calls and receives calls, and that's all it does. Yeah, but... But I need help with this one because it does things that I don't even want it to do. And I can't tell it not to do it. We need help. We need help doing a physical task. How many people have we moved from this church body? Sheldon after lunch is going to go move his son. People need help moving. We have moved enough that we've done it with a lot of people and we've done it with not many people. And not many people is not fun. The last move we did, the bulk of the move was Jerry Callahan and me. Remember Jerry? Remember that day? He moved, he moved, picked up a pickup truck with a horse trailer, and we put the furniture in the back of the horse trailer, and it was about a 90-degree day, and at the end, about killed each other. That's how hot it was. One wasn't fun with not a lot of help. We need help. That's why there's so many YouTube videos, right? You're in the middle of a project. We swapped cars with our kids. They had our minivan while they were in problem. We had their, their little Chevy Cobalt, and of course, one of the headlights burned out. How hard can this be? <laughs> You just, you just pop it out, pop out the bulb, put another one, pop it right back in. Oh, no. No, no. It's in a garage, partly hanging out. The lid, the, I'm like, Ugh. go to YouTube. There's a trick to it. It's a certain way it got twisted. Go to YouTube, see the thing, bam, had it out. If I had not done, I would have broken the headlight. After I got it in and fixed it, I still wanted to break it. <laughs> right? We need help. We need help. That's why there are so many ministries that we're part of, Hands and Feet, Food Bank, Samaritan's Purse. People need help just surviving. Community Aid, Jubilee, Blue Mountain, Red Cross, ministries that are delivering people from slavery. That's why we're partnering in some way with Five Stones. It's down in Anvil because they are partnering with a child rescue initiative. They are rescuing children in other nations that are in slavery. And these guys are former special ops that are retired, and they are the tip of the spear. They go in, and they are armed, and they are setting children free from slavery in countries where we can't get and we are not. That's, that's, they need help surviving. We're part of that. We need help on a daily basis, living out the life and the mission that Jesus has called us to. We need help, and he knows that. Jesus knows we need help. He, we need help in knowing him, in making him known, and in being transformed. And he has given us that help. He knew it for the original disciples, and he knows it for us. And that's where we're going to see him emphasizing as we pick it up in John 16. We're in John 16. We want to start with verse 5. We need help. Jesus knows it, and he provided it. <clears throat> but he starts with a strange... A strange question. It seems like a contradiction. John 16, verse 5. He says to his disciples, Now, I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him 
to you. So last week we were talking about the cost of relationship, the, the hatred, the persecution, even for some believers, death that comes simply because we are followers of Jesus. And so then Jesus on the heels of that says that he is going away and, and yet he asks them this question. No one asks him, where are you going? Well, that seems like a contradiction because in John 13, 36, Jesus, or Peter specifically asked Jesus, Lord, where are you going? He asked him that very question. And in 14, 5, Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how do we know the way? So two disciples have asked him that specific theme. Jesus is hinting at a different issue. He knows that they've asked him physically that the issue is he has just told them how they are going to suffer, that they're going to be persecuted. The times are going to get hard and they're going to face that. And then he's going away. He's going away. That's what they're going to face. What's their, what he's asking them really is you're not, you're not asking me where you're going. You're not concerned about me. Why? They're concerned about them. What is going to happen to me? What about us? In light of this cost, in light of this pressure we're going to face, in light of what's going to happen, what about me? How am I going to exist? And they are filled. Jesus says you're filled with grief. Because I've told you this, because things are going to get hard and I'm going away, you're filled with grief. The word grief is sorrow, heaviness. I love this, grudging, like trudging through mud, like slogging, sadness. And those feelings can drive us. They can drive us to withdraw and not be part of what God has called us to be part of. We just kind of pull in. And we've been trained to do that through a pandemic, right? Just go in, no, close the windows, shades down, don't come out. We've been trained to not go out and not branch out and to be afraid, so how we respond in hard times affects us. Are we, is, it all, is it all about me? I was driving in the car this week. I had WJTL on, and they had these little blurbs, and these little teaching moments from people. And this, this particular one was from Tim Tebow, of all people. It was really interesting. He came on and went, wow, okay. And, uh, you know, because he's played football, baseball, he's tried a little of everything. But he's, he's had influence in everything that he's done. And he says, he talked about a runner's high. And I've experienced that in the days when I was a runner. He said, you get to a place where when you're exerting effort and you're running, that certain endorphins kick in and this running just becomes effortless. Effortless. You're just flowing along and it's hardly like your legs are moving and the oxygen's coming in. You're just pumping along. And I've experienced that at various times. He said, there's also a helper's high. There's a helper's high. He said, when we are focused on ourselves, when it's, oh, woe is me, what's going to happen to me, when we're always inward, that releases certain endorphins. There's a chemical action that happens in your body that actually keeps depressing you, and you end up in sorrow and heaviness and grudging. He said, but the opposite is true. When you actually reach out and you help someone else, when you focus on what their needs are, your body also releases certain endorphins that give you this sense of elation, this sense of your body is doing well and you're recovering and you're part of something. Science is always catching up to God. They're just figuring this out, that this is a good thing physiologically when you help someone. And Jesus says, I don't come to serve, to be served, but to serve. And he says in Matthew and in Mark, if you want to be the greatest, be the least, be a servant. God's known this from all along. And so that's what Jesus is pointing them to. He says, I need to go away. It's going to be good for you, but, but you, you're not concerned about how it's going to happen to me. Do you understand what's going to happen? You're going to need that concern for other people. And that's what he's pointing out to them. So he, he corrects their feelings, because what do we know about feelings? They're a blind guide. Don't let them drive. Don't let them drive. They're part of who we are, but if you do the right thing, if you do truth, feelings eventually come along and get lined up behind you. Okay? So Jesus corrects their feelings and their thinking. He says, I'm going away. This is actually for your good. This has to happen. This is for your good. The word good, simpharo. To bear or bring together, 
to carry with others, to help, to be profitable, to be expedient. So he said, this is for your good. Actually, what's going to happen is there's someone that's going to come along beside you and bear with you the rest of your life. Because why? Because Jesus can't in his physical form, do that. He only walked in physical form with the disciples. They went from one place to another. And when he was in one place, that's where he was. And he couldn't be in another place. That was the limit he put on himself in being in human form. But that's not the limit on us now. And it's not the limit on God because of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 12. Sheldon unpacked this a number of weeks ago beautifully. I tell you the truth, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. They will do even greater things than these. Not greater in miracles. What's a greater miracle than raising someone from the dead? Not greater in terms of that. Greater in terms of saturation. You're going to reach the world. You're going to reach the earth because I will be in every believer. And where every believer goes, the good works will be done in a greater saturation than when Jesus was physically on the earth. This is a good thing. He's going to bear with us and help us as we know God, make him known, and are transformed. It is God in us. It's his at work, he's at work through us. So he has to depart. Remember the word has to, had to, day, what's necessary because of the nature of the case. The case is the gospel needs to be spread to the whole world. And so what has to happen is he goes away and the Holy Spirit comes. He is the helper. He's the comforter. He's the counselor. He's at work through us. Last week, I I told you that I was overwhelmed in Philadelphia helping our grandkids move. It was kind of a dark moment, just overwhelmed by the concentration and appetite for darkness. And yet... Beth reminded me, and some of you, I mean, I had a couple of beautiful texts from, from Sue Vogt just reminding me what I already knew, but I needed reminded, I needed help, that God is at work. God is at work. Do you know that that same Saturday, last Saturday, where we were on South 21st Street, a couple of streets over at the Lycoris Center, just, I mean, not, not far at all, there's what's called the Extend Conference was happening. This is a conference for 12 to 25-year-olds for them to know who the Lord is, be bold in walking with the Lord, making him known in the city of Philadelphia and beyond. So a couple blocks away from um, where I'm in, where I'm almost overwhelmed by the darkness, God was moving. God was moving. We need to remind each other of that. We need to help each other in that. We need to declare that God is moving. He's moving. In Ephrata, there have been Jesus tent rallies this summer. Hundreds have come to Christ. In Ephrata, down the street from us, August 20th, we're going to do prayer and praise here. We're going to do some acoustic praise, and we're going to pray. We're going to pray for our kids. We're going to pray for our community. We're going to pray for families. If you want to be prayed for, simply come. It's not going to be this great, you know, organized thing. We're going to come together as the people of God, and we're going to praise him, and we're going to use the weapon of praise, and we're going to pray. That's all we're going to do. God is going to move because that's what he does. He moves in that. Same thing is happening over in Dillsburg as they're praying for the coming school year. August 22nd. August 22nd is a Monday. Our community pool in Palm Rye, it's a community pool. Anybody can come swimming. They're going to have a worship at the community pool. Now, I don't know how they're going to do electronics, Brad, near water. Don't know how that's going to happen. They're going to have a worship band there. We're going to worship and swim. I love it. I love it because the rest of the time, it's like they, I don't know, they, they wink 104 on them. I'm thinking, oh, do I have to hear Jimmy Buffett again? Oh, my gosh, you're sitting there. No, it's going to be worship at the community pool. God, how does that happen? God is moving. God is moving. Uprise Festival, Sheldon told you about. I believe it's, it's awesome. You have the fairground, you have, you have Shippensburg University. Two different worldviews. In Shippensburg, that God is moving. God is moving. September 24th, the Franklin Graham God Loves You Tour will be in Allentown, and then September 25th down in York. You have information about that. It's on a bulletin board, been in your bulletin. God is moving. And for us here at Caring Community, VBS, you know what Danelle said about praying for some of these kids. For some of them, we know that interaction with with God's word and hearing about the love and having the love of Jesus expressed to them, it's the only time it happens in their lives all year. 
all year is at VBS. We're at a VBS rally when they come. And a lot of times, Ernie gets in the van, has to go get them to make sure they get here. It's the only time they have interaction with God's word. God's moving. They were here. They were here. Hands and feet. God is moving. Building relationships with people that you and I, you and I normally would never even see, let alone interact with. You drive on 83, you go down to PennDOT. Do you know you go down to PennDOT to get your license done? You drive by an entire culture that exists, you can't see them. They're right off in the weeds. You I mean, you're, they're only a couple feet away. You don't even know they're there. It's an entire different city that's there. They're ministering to them. God is moving. And then all of your personal experiences, what God is doing in our lives, we need the encouragement of that. We need to tell each other that. God is moving. He's helping us. He's helping us. We need his help. I love the worship team. They're, they're singing, we won't move without you. It was one of the songs. We won't move without you, true. But will we move with him? When he's moving, and he is, will we join him? Will we recognize that he's moving and we'll move with him? Because he is moving. You're going to have Saturdays like I had. You're going to have moments where you're overwhelmed. And that's why we come together and encourage one another and go, okay, that was a dark day. Now let's get back out at it. Because God is, he's moving. He's moving. Let's pick it up in verse 8. <clears throat> so the counselor comes. Look what he's going to do. Guys, in the next four verses is a summary of the gospel. This is it in four verses. This is the gospel. When he comes, the Holy Spirit, not it, he. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not some substance. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is God himself. He is in us. God himself. That's who he is. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to... Not to so let's look, put that panel up. Let's look at the word convict, because you're going you're gonna to see this is what's happening as part of the gospel. The word convict, elego, kind of like Lego, except cooler than that. <laughs> it means to convict, to refute, to bring to light, to expose, to call to account, to prove to be wrong. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Okay, we share, we live out the reality of who Jesus is. We share it by our character being transformed so we act and look and respond more like Jesus. He's the one that proves him right and them wrong. That's what he did to me. That's what he did to Sheldon. That's what he does to everyone who is a believer who goes, the way I've been living is wrong and needs to change. It's an unbeliever, an unbeliever. That's right. That's what he, that's what he does. He's an unbeliever. He convicts. Right, so that's what he's doing. How? He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So he is, the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world in three key areas that are the encapsulation of the gospel. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Let's start with sin. He's going to convict the world about sin. Right there is where they all have problems. It's where I had a problem. Nobody wants to deal with their sin. Who wants to, be, who, who wants to have pointed out? Yet that's the reality of our condition. Sin means to miss the mark. You miss, what, you miss the mark. Not believing in Jesus, not believing in Jesus is the sin that cannot be overcome. It can't be overcome. Because the reality of who Jesus is, he's the one that what he did on the cross, paying the penalty for our sin, he is the entrance into having all of our sin taken care of. So the sin that can't be overcome is not believing in the one who takes care of all the rest of it. That's the issue. Jesus, in, in John 14, 6, we've already talked about it. Jesus said, I am the way, 
the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Way back, this seems like a long time ago, way back in John 3, verse 7, Jesus Nicodemus, a Pharisee, teacher of the law, Jesus said to him, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Must. Necessity lying in the nature of the case. What's the nature of the case? Our sin. Our sin. And the only answer to that is being, being born again, is accepting that Jesus paid the penalty for our sin, and that is what brings us into the second thing, righteousness. Righteousness. Right standing with God. A condition acceptable to God. What is that standing? What's that condition? The condition is one whose sin has been paid for, who's not guilty of it, because Jesus took the guilt for us. His payment is accepted by us. We accept it by faith, and righteousness is applied to us. Right standing is applied to us. You and I can't stand right enough on our own. That's one of the, one of the huge myths at play in our culture. If I just do enough good to outweigh the bad, the good wins and I'll be okay. That's very prevalent ideology in the church in America. If I, I, I know I do some bad, but my, my, I do more good than bad, I'll be okay. I'm not a murderer. I'm not this and that. I'm okay. That, that just doesn't work. That is not righteousness. That's not right standing with God. Romans 3, verses 21 to 24. Paul writes this to the church at Rome. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness, the right standing, the condition acceptable to God has been made known. He's revealed it to us. To which the law and prophets testify. All the Old Testament points to the need of a new covenant and salvation in Christ. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. That is how we have right standing with God, through faith in Christ. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. No difference between all of the differences out in society where we want to divide people and categorize people. Doesn't matter. There's no difference. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That's righteousness. He convicts the world of their need of righteousness and that righteousness is possible in the person of Jesus. It's validated by God. By doing what? By raising Jesus from the dead and him ascending into heaven. Paid in full. It's paid in full. Now, built into the gospel then is accountability for what decision you and I make. And that's judgment. This is this is the part of the message where it's not the warm fuzzy that many want to go to church and hear about. But this is built into the gospel. There is an, an assessment of guilt and an accompanying punishment if you are found guilty. That's, that used to be true in our legal system. That is slipping away, and when it slips away, so will the whole infrastructure of our society that holds it together. And that is happening, not with God, not with God. There is an accompanying punishment. This judgment is, is not faced by believers. Understand that. There, there is a judgment, there is an assessing of believers for fruit, for what we've done and for rewards. This judgment is not for believers. This is, this is a, an assessment of guilt that you did not believe. Satan and says, because Satan stands condemned Already, why? Because of his rejection of and opposition to Jesus. That's why he stands condemned. And all who do not believe in Jesus face the same judgment that Satan faces. We stand condemned. We did, we did John 3.16 in the song, For God so loved the world, right? For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But look at verses 17 and 18. 
This should be on a t-shirt too. John 3, 17 and 18. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him, in Jesus, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already. See, the condemnation, the judgment is built into the gospel. The consequence is built in. If it wasn't built in, I'm going to finish this and I'm going to get to this point. Stands condemned already. Why? Because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. It's about Jesus. Now, if, if that weren't built in, and there are those who believe this, you call it universal salvation. At the end, God, because of his mercy and his grace, he'll go, okay, well, you can come in anyway. If that's true, if that's true, then it makes a mockery of the cross. Then what Jesus did on the cross is a joke. It's of no value. If he's going to let everybody in anyway, and there's no accountability based on what Jesus suffered and died on the cross for, then it's of no value. But he, but he sent his son. Dads, moms, sacrifice one of your children. And then there's... And then there's Absolutely, absolutely mockery for that, and there's no accountability for that. You, you wouldn't tolerate that, never. But that's, see, that's the justice, the holiness, and the mercy and the grace of God all in one package. Now, I want to tell you that that's the gospel in four verses, but here's what's really important. As we stand here today, Righteousness, right standing is what Jesus still offers and wants. He is wanting people to come to salvation. He's wanting people to be redeemed. He does not want people to face judgment and condemnation. Ezekiel 33. God is talking to Israel, his people, through the prophet Ezekiel, and they are just like cyclically disobedient. Okay, God blesses them, and they're obedient for a while. Then, oh, wow, we can do whatever we want. And then he's got to punish them. And then they turn and they come back. And in Ezekiel 33, verses 10 and 11, God speaks through the prophet Ezekiel, Son of man, say this to the Israelites. Say this to America. This is what you are saying. Many Americans aren't saying it, but I'm telling you, it's the ethic that is saturating America. Our offenses and sins weigh us down. We think it's a problem somewhere. We want to define the problem as something else. But the weighing down you sense in America, what the conviction of the Holy Spirit is, it's our sin that's doing that. That's what's needed. And we are wasting away because of them. How can we live? How, what's going to happen to us? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked but rather that they would turn from their ways and live. Turn, repent, recognize you're on the wrong path, and come and follow me. That's what repentance is. That's what Jesus wants. Turn, exclamation point. It's emphatic. It's imperative. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Why will you die, America? In our bulletin every single week. Second Peter 3 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. What's the promise? That he's coming back. That he's coming back. As some understand slowness, instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The Holy Spirit is moving. He's moving to bring people to salvation, to redemption. And for those already saved, for many of us in this room, he is moving to continue to transform us so we more and more accurately represent who Jesus is to the world around us. Man, man can't fix this. Man can't fix Man trying to fix this is like putting a cat 
in charge of a bunny's nest. Yes, yeah, I am. Bunnies are dumb. We've lived in this townhouse now eight years, and every year out front in the yard, the bunnies build a nest. They don't build a nest. They tear it out. In the, I mean, we got bushes everywhere where they could hide their bunny nest, hide it where it'd be safe. No, no, right out in the middle of the yard. That's why they're called dumb bunnies, <laughs> right? So they hide it right out in the middle of the yard where, I mean, it's like I can see it. I don't even, and, and so the hawks find it, the cats find it. Well, well there's a bunny nest this year, and Beth, Beth is determined we're saving the bunnies. Okay. So she takes a lawn chair out. She puts it upside down over the bunny's nest so that the hawks can't swoop in and get the bunnies. And, okay, so we go for a while with the, with the lawn chair, and then it's time for the mowers to come. So we take the lawn chair up, and she puts a little, a little push toy that Scooter Pie used. You know, it's a yellow thing. She walks behind to learn how to walk. She's abandoned that, but we still have it. I don't know why. We still have this thing. Maybe I'm going to need it soon. But. So she puts, she puts that in the yard over the bunny's nest, and she tapes a cardboard sign on it to them. It says, Bunny's Nest. <laughs> and an arrow pointing down. I kid you not. I kid you not. And so the mower comes. The guy comes. This, this guy, he's sweat as high. He, he sees us and he goes. And so he mows around it. <laughs> he mows around it. So, so, all right. So now it's been a couple weeks of this. And we think, well, fine, certainly the bunnies have made it by now. Okay, they're good. So I finally take this thing up. I put it in the garage. Saturday morning, we get up and out in the yard's a dead bunny. Yeah, oh, not an eaten bunny, just a dead bunny. And we know who did it. There's a cat that lives in the cul-de-sac over. He's, he sacks out on the front porch. He's fat and sassy. He's well-fed and well taken care of. He simply came over to kill the bunny. Why? Because that is what they do. Do you understand that? Men trying to fix what men have done won't work because sin is what we do. We can't fix it. So we go inside. This makes me clean it up. So we go inside and we're sitting out back on our porch that looks out over the cornfield, out on the Milton Hershey land, and we're lamenting about this little bunny, talking about the bunniness. While we're talking about this, a hawk swoops down right about 10 feet out, outside of our thing with a chipmunk in its claws. <laughs> Just swing by. I'm like, yes. Yeah, like, and so, so Chip and Dale, I don't know which one it was, but Chip and Dale are now a solo team. You know what I mean? Because he wasn't taking that chipmunk for a ride. Right? Why? Because that is what hawks do. It's what they do. That won't be fixed until Jesus comes again. And he rules and reigns for a thousand years. And the lion will lay down with the lamb. And the bunny and the cat will lay together. But not now. Because it's what they do. And sin is what we do. We can't fix ourselves. It is not possible. We need help. And so the Holy Spirit comes and convicts the world, the ways and systems of man that caused the problem. He convicts the world in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. That's what God is doing, and we are part of that. Let's pick it up in verse 12. Whew. Man, here we do. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. <laughs> That's true this morning, too. Um, but when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. The word there is teach. He will teach you all truth. He will show you, explain it. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. You see the, tr the Trinity is right there. Father, Son, Holy Spirit represented right there in unity in helping us. He'll make it known. So you see, there was more to come. They couldn't bear it. Why couldn't they bear it? They couldn't bear it because they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. The Holy Spirit was yet to come. That would happen at Pentecost. More scripture was yet to, most of the New Testament was yet to be written. There was more to be lived out, more to come. 
And our lives as disciples of Jesus can't be understood or lived out without the Holy Spirit's help. We can't do it. We need his help. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are in total unity about helping us. They're the ones that, they're the ones that carried the writers of Scripture. That's what, what 2 Peter 1.21. The writers didn't make this up on their own. People say that. They were carried by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture, all of it, is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the messenger of God, the servant of God, that's us, so that we can be fully equipped, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we can trust the Holy Spirit to help us understand his word and live it out. And that's why we come together. He wants us to know. He wants to help us. So what is your response to the gospel? Sin. Sin. Your sin, righteousness, the offer of Jesus, and judgment. Are you still still condemned in your own sin? There's no way to, there's, there's no sugarcoat in this. If you haven't accepted Jesus, the word, his words in red say, you stand condemned already. There's only one fix for that. You accept Jesus. It says, believe, accept Jesus for who he is, the Savior. And, and you, will, you will have a righteousness that is his put onto you. You become righteous. You have right standing with God. Believe, believe, and you'll be declared righteous. Second, if you are saved, hard times. Are they filling you with sorrow? Are you overwhelmed? Is there a heaviness? Is there sadness? Is there drudgery? Look to the Holy Spirit and look to the Holy Spirit together. That's why we come together, to encourage one another, led by the Holy Spirit, to continue to get up each morning and keep swinging. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. He is to help. Get into God's word. Let me, our our calendar this morning, our calendar this morning we, we, we keep it in the bathroom, the flip calendar, but while our granddaughter's with us for a month, we put it down in the kitchen. So the scripture, every time she walks in and out of the kitchen, whether she reads it, sees it or not, it's there. The scripture was the first song we did to open up. It smells like God to me. Just, just, he's moving. He, we need to remind each other of that. Tell the stories of how God is faithful and what he's doing. Look for his move in our lives and join him. Jesus told Peter in Matthew 16, 19, he says, I'm basically giving you the keys to the kingdom. We as believers, guys, he's entrusted us with the keys to his kingdom. So how about we, how about we use them and open up the kingdom to others? Because he will help us. He is moving. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you for helping us, continuing to help us. We need it. I need it. We need the help of your Holy Spirit, and you have promised, and you are faithful. You are moving. Help us see it. And for anyone here or listening online, if you have not taken that step, the Holy Spirit is on you. He's convicting you. He's after you. He wants you. He does not want you to be condemned. He does not want you to face that judgment. Come to him. Come to him. And for us who have done that, Lord, make us sensitive to your move. Help us see what you're doing. Help us declare it. Help us walk in your ways that you would be made known. Thank you for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul. Worship team. I invite you to join us again as we close.
Jesus said that um, a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground apart from my father's care. How can, how can God keep track of all of his creation that has died? Bunnies, chipmunks, all of that. How great, how great of a God do we have that, can keep, that wants to keep track of that? He can do that, and, and that's the God who has promised he'll help us. Knowing God, making him known, being transformed, that's more than we can bear on our own. That's more than we can pull off on our own. But he has promised us, that God has promised us, he will help us. Let's walk in that help, make him known. Amen? Yes. Go in that help. <clears throat>